This is a mechanism of disease map for iron deficiency anemia. I'll be talking about the etiology of iron deficiency anemia, as well as the pathophysiology and how it manifests in the clinic. All of these bubbles here are color-coded according to these core concepts listed in this legend up in the top right. And if you want to take a screenshot of all of this, go ahead. I'll be clearing all of these items and talking through each of them one by one. So let's get started with the central mechanism of iron deficiency anemia. It's iron deficiency, as you can guess, and essentially your body does not have enough iron to meet its needs. When that happens, your body is not gonna be able to do heme synthesis like it normally should. You'll specifically have decreased binding of iron to protoporphyrin, and this is the last step of hemoglobin production. So when you have decreased hemoglobin production, you'll also have decreased oxygen carrying capacity and decreased delivery of oxygen to the tissues. That's the function of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin requires iron. So if you don't have iron, you can't make hemoglobin, you can't deliver oxygen to the tissues as well. Now there are a few um, big buckets for the etiologies of iron deficiency anemia. First is increased blood loss. You could lose blood directly through trauma or through internal bleeding, and that can lead to iron deficiency anemia. If you're losing your blood, you're losing the iron that is already carrying your oxygen, and you won't be able to uh, replenish that quite as quickly as you lost it. You can have decreased iron absorption in the intestines. This is usually an intestinal problem, so you're still consuming iron like you should be um, in your diet, but there's a problem that's leading to decreased iron absorption once the iron's inside your stomach and your small intestine, and the duodenum to be specific. You can have decreased iron intake. This is kind of a malnutrition problem where you're not consuming as much iron um, as you need and you're not getting iron that way. And lastly, there are some metabolic conditions in the body where you have increased iron demand. So you can become iron deficient that way as well. And we'll talk about the etiologies first and then we'll see how many of the manifestations come from this O2 delivery to the tissues. So first, let's go into a little more detail on increased blood loss. As I mentioned, this can happen through trauma. For instance, after a car accident, you might be bleeding out from the limbs if you cut a big artery or vein, but you can also have internal bleeding. All of that would count as blood loss where the blood, where the blood is no longer in your arteries and veins, no longer in your circulatory system, and your body then has to make more iron, uh, sorry, make more hemoglobin using iron to replenish that lost blood. In young women, a common cause of iron deficiency anemia is menorrhagia or unusually heavy periods. And um, a lot of times teenage girls can become iron deficient that way as well. It's a monthly bleed. And um, if they don't consume enough iron to repopulate um, their blood cells, then they can become iron deficient. A more rare cause is actually genetic and hereditary. You can have a hemorrhagic diathesis. This is like the hemophilia disorders as well as von Willebrand's disease. This might lead to like kind of small bleeding after like a cut or an IV um, can lead to some internal bleeding as well. So that can also cause blood loss sufficient to cause um, iron deficient anemia. A common cause in older people is GI bleeds and there are a few potential causes of this. Less common causes are Meckel's diverticulum and hookworm infestation. But mainly when you have iron deficiency in an older patient, um, you wanna check a GI bleed to make sure they don't have a GI malignancy like colon cancer, which can cause you to kind of bleed slowly into your stool and um, you can become iron deficient that way as well. Another way to get a GI bleed, typically in a little younger patients are peptic ulcer disease. And there are a few major etiologies of this. First is the use of NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen. Um, these are known to cause ulcers in your stomach and intestines, and they do so through this mechanism. They inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, which leads to a decreased production of prostaglandins, which leads to decreased bicarbonate and mucus production in the stomach and intestines. And the bicarbonate and mucus actually act as protection for the stomach intestines. So when you don't have bicarb and mucus, the gastric acid will be able to erode the mucosa and you can end up with these peptic ulcers that bleed. So that's another way to get iron deficient anemia. H. pylori infection is the other major cause of peptic ulcer disease, and we'll see that H. pylori infection can also lead to decreased iron absorption in just a second. So what are the other causes of decreased iron absorption? First, it can be anything inflammatory in your gut. So 
um, in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease as well as celiac disease are both inflammatory processes that can affect the duodenum where iron is absorbed. So those can lead to decreased iron absorption. Anything that removes a portion of your duodenum can also affect your iron absorption. So bariatric surgery is a big one, and uh, any kind of duodenal resection, say after a gunshot wound or after uh, a, a malignancy or a tumor, can cause decreased iron absorption in the duodenum. There's a group of conditions where you have achloridia or hypochloridia. This means decreased um, hydrochloric acid in your stomach. So you're to, to absorb iron in your stomach, you do need to have a sufficiently acidic environment. And when you don't make the hypochloric acid, um, sorry, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, you'll, uh, you'll have decreased iron absorption. Now, there's a few causes to this. One is using PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors that people use for, um, uh, for gastric reflux. So if somebody has very chronic gastric reflux and they're using PPIs for a long time, they can have decreased iron absorption through that mechanism. Another is having a VIPoma. This is a neoplasm in the stomach that can cause um, decreased stomach acids that impairs your iron absorption. And lastly is atrophic gastritis, an inflammatory process that can affect your stomach and your absorption of iron that way. You can have atrophic gastritis from H. pylori, the same bug that causes peptic ulcer disease and increased blood loss. And there's also an autoimmune form of atrophic gastritis that can also cause achloridia and decreased iron absorption in the duodenum. Next, we have decreased iron intake. This, as I mentioned, is a, uh, is a kind of a malnutrition issue. So you could be undernourished, you could be not getting enough iron in your diet. Um, Vegan-based diet might put you at risk for this, but it's also possible to have it even if you're not vegan. So in the United States, at least, we have a lot of grains and flour that are fortified with iron. But in some other countries, they might not have this iron fortification. So if you have like a wheat-based diet or a flour-based diet in those countries, you could have decreased iron intake that leads to iron deficiency anemia. And lastly, these are a few metabolic conditions that lead to increased iron demand. Pregnancy is a big one where you're not only producing hemoglobin uh, for um, yourself, but you also have a baby that you need to take care of now, so that increases your iron demands. Lactation is a big one that increases your iron demands. Growth spurts in kids and teenagers that are growing very quickly might all of a sudden need more diet, more iron than their diet is providing them. And lastly, epotherapy. That's erythropoietin. This is a, uh, a protein that's made in your kidneys that's used to make more um, blood cells, red blood cells. So if you're using epo to like help somebody um, make more red blood cells, you want to make sure that they have the proper amounts of iron in their diet to make those red blood cells. So this is the etiology. Now let's get into the manifestations. And I mentioned that a lot of the manifestations are going to come from decreased hemoglobin production and decreased oxygen carrying capacity. First, when you have decreased hemoglobin production, you'll be able to see that on your blood work. So you'll have iron deficiency anemia labs. So for instance, you'll have decreased hemoglobin, you'll have decreased hematocrit, on the CBC and iron studies. Iron studies will also show decreased ferritin, which means decreased iron stores, and you'll have decreased iron, um, free iron in the blood as well. In addition, your blood cells will have a low MCV, low mean corpuscular volume, so it'll be a little bit smaller. They'll have a, mean, a low mean corpuscular hemoglobin as well. They'll be a little more pale red blood cells. And you'll also either have a normal or low reticulocyte count. And remember, reticulocytes are the precursors to red blood cells. So it makes sense that if you are iron deficient and not able to make the red blood cells, not able to make the hemoglobin that goes into the red blood cells, it makes sense that your body will kind of tone down the production of reticulocytes to make red blood cells as well. The decreased hemoglobin production is directly seen in pallor and pale conjunctiva. So you'll notice that somebody kind of loses their color in those two places. You can also get nonspecific symptoms from decreased oxygen carrying capacity. So you can have shortness of breath, dyspnea, lethargy, and fatigue, all from decreased oxygen carrying capacity. These are some other symptoms you get in iron deficiency anemia specifically. And I've put lighter arrows here because we're not exactly sure of the pathogenesis for all of these, but we suspect it's related to decreased oxygen carrying capacity. So you can have coilinichia, which is a spoon-like nail deformity. And I should also mention that you can also have brittle nails in addition um, to coilinichia. You can have pica and dysphagia. Pica is a weird symptom where you end up eating non-edible things like ice or paint chips. 
and that's strongly associated with iron deficiency anemia. You could have angular chelitis. This is fissures in the corner of your mouth. It almost looks like the corners of their mouths are chapped or cracking um, in iron deficiency anemia. And you can have a big beefy red tongue, also called atrophic glossitis. There are a number of other symptoms that come from increased blood loss, especially when it happens pretty quickly, um, when you have quick hemodynamic changes. So um, for some of these, suspect that it, it, it occurs when the blood loss is pretty quick and the body's not able to compensate. So the person is kind of dehydrated and loses a bunch of blood at the same time. So first, when you have a quick decrease in hemodynamic volume, the patient might have decreased cerebral perfusion, which could lead to them passing out or almost passing out. That's syncope or presyncope. They might also have a decreased preload if their um, hem hemodynamic volume decreases pretty, pretty substantially and pretty quickly. That can lead to a decreased stroke volume in the heart, which leads to decreased cardiac output. If your cardiac output is low, that means blood's gonna back up behind your heart and you can have an increased pulmonary venous pressure, which can result in pulmonary edema. And the pulmonary edema can also contribute to the shortness of breath, to the dyspnea. If you have a decreased cardiac output, your body's response, it's gonna see that you have low blood pressure, low cardiac output. You're gonna have baroreceptors that trigger your sympathetic nervous system. So this can lead to tachycardia. And again, remember, this is all pretty acute decrease in hemodynamic volume. So this is kind of happening um, pretty quickly. If you're losing blood pretty quickly, you can end up with tachycardia. On kind of like a longer time scale, if you're chronically losing blood over a long time, um, and your baroreceptors are constantly triggering the sympathetic nervous system, you can actually end up with long-term cardiac remodeling where your heart is like kind of built stronger and bigger um, to kind of accommodate for your decrease in cardiac output. And that can lead to high output cardiac failure where your heart is kind of getting big and beefy and trying to make up for your decreased blood pressure, but um, it, it doesn't work and you can only compensate so much. So eventually you can have symptoms of heart failure. That includes pulmonary edema, and that can also lead to shortness of breath. It's also possible to see other symptoms of heart failure as well, like a JVD in the neck or leg edema, lower extremity edema as well. So this has been an overview of iron deficiency anemia. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.